All right, hello Facebook Live now. If you can't hear us, leave it in the comments. We'll update it as we go. Uh, hello to everybody else. Uh, my name is Brian Stellard. I'm a science communicator, producer, all those things for uh, Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. And I'm excited today for our next installment of Cocktails and Chromosomes. Today we're going to get to hear from Emilio Dos Santos, uh, Dr. Emilio Dos Santos. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about her. And like any good professional, I'm going to read straight from my phone. Excuse me one second. <laughs> All right, so Dr. Camilo Dos Santos came from the U.S., from Brazil, to investigate a correlation that was first observed nearly 100 years ago. That a pregnancy early in a woman's life dramatically reduces her risk of developing breast cancer later in life. On the hunt for ways to prevent breast cancer, Dr. Dos Santos examines the epigenome, a system of molecular marks that change the way genes are expressed without changing the DNA itself. Maybe a lot of you know this, maybe a lot of you don't. We usually call it the dark matter of the genome in another way. Uh, she's been named a Victory Over Cancer Scholar by the V Foundation, a Rita Allen Foundation Scholar, as well as a recipient of the Pershing Square Stone Prize for Young Investigators in Cancer Research. So she's, she's pretty cool. Uh, so we're gonna get just start hearing straight from Camilla now, and uh, let me turn to my gun. All right, thanks. Don't worry. 
This is totally PG. Okay? Um, in the era of electronics and facial recognition devices such as our cell phone, a study recently published by the University of Nebraska testing not only men but also test women and how, where do you, they look first when they encounter a woman concluded that across the board women and men look at women's breasts before they actually look at their eyes um, it's not for everyone I'm sorry there has to be this highly ideal one would say body shape would you think that is totally discrimination should not have a conclusion like that but anyway it just means that across the board the first thing that we look at is women's breasts and all we want us to do is just like you know look up here first let's start a conversation from here first speaking of women's breast size um, Morgs across the US have been reporting problems with their crematory machines. And it just turned out that breast implants, there are a few parts of our body that do not fully melt when a body gets cremated. So they have to replace machines that many, many years were working for a long time. And I think that all says to us that even at the end, we can figure it out if you're saving some secrets about sizes. Speaking of sizes, I did a little research. The largest natural breast, it's 109.22 centimeters. Real breasts, and around chest over nipple measurements, 177.8 centimeters. This is the equivalent for the audience that does not need to buy a bra. Uh, it's the, the equivalent of a size 52L. Average women in the US use a 34, 35, I mean less, but then 52. So they can get that big naturally. Um, speaking of being breasts and a uh, woman's you know, concern as we age, is that gravity can be very mean, right? Things don't look so up as we age, as we nurse. But a study actually from uh, Cornell University not long ago actually showed that breastfeeding is actually beneficial and smoking actually has a much stronger effect on the droop effect in the breast. So we are all concerned about nursing and how aging has a gravitational pull pushing things down. So smoking has a problem too. I just say that, you know, thank goodness for Victoria's Secrets that come up with the miraculous push-up bras um, and can really show us very snappy dressers. And as I was putting, who in the audience knows Droopy the dog? Yeah, I figured. I, I figured, I, I think that I just gave it away my age. So it was a cartoon from a long time ago. Jokes aside, breast makes the fundamental nutrition for an infant, for a newborn offspring, specifically in the case of prematurity. So I have two kids. I try to be a very good mom, but I'm a horrible incubator. Both of my kids were born premature. My second one, he was born at 20 weeks. Uh, in his case, and in cases like him, breast milk is the source of life. We give to the kids immune cells, and those immune cells serve as the short-term immunity of the babies because they are still developing theirs. Those immune cells also help to coat the intestines and help them deal with bacteria and process food better. And through the breast milk, we also pass on antibodies. The life of experience of a mother in terms of what we have been going through and what our immune cells have experienced, we give it to them. And I know that nowadays became a, a source of option, uh, especially for working moms, um, you know, going into a formula, which I use it as well. But in cases like prematurity, breast, can, uh, breast milk can save lives. 
we see a baby, we think of pregnancy, right? Pregnancy is the stage that it starts with conception. It's followed through by developing of an embryo, a fetus, a little baby, and it's pretty much done with the delivery of baby and starting nursing. Actually, pregnancy is more than the baby development. Hormones that are released during pregnancy affect many organs in our body. And I'm showing you a few of the organs that they have reached by, 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 breast, by pregnancy hormones. Our brain, pregnancy alters our brain function. Mom's in the room, am I right? It doesn't go away, by the way. You think it doesn't. No, it does not. Um, pregnancy hormones alter how our brain functions and how we deal with decision making. So, and that is totally driven by hormones that are in our bloodstream during pregnancy. Pregnancy hormones also change our cardiovascular system. Blood starts being pumping through our body much more rapidly just because, you know, there's a larger space to fill, baby. So we have to make sure that we are bringing oxygen to every single part of our body. It also changes tissues like the pancreas that it secretes very important hormones that keeps our body in function. And sometimes it even can go the opposite. If there is any borderline condition, pregnancy hormones can even drive those conditions to become exacerbated. And an example is uh, gestational diabetes, which again, I checked the mark. Um, so it influences all of those bodies, but in spe especially influences development of the, of the breast. Pregnancy is the physiological stimuli that turns our breast in functional glands. Without pregnancy, we have breasts, but they, they're not working. Breasts are meant to make milk, and that only happens in response to pregnancy hormones. And what I'm gonna show here to you now, it's pictures of our breasts, histological pictures of our breasts throughout the pregnancy development. With conception and gestation, our breast cells start expanding, they start dividing, they start proliferating, and that's so there's gonna be enough milk factories available to make milk and nurse the offspring during lactation. The process of lactation comes with always replenishing the milk supply and feeding the offspring. And this is why the, uh, a lot of um, nurse practitioners, uh, they suggest that we have the supply that our kids need because the more you breastfeed, the more that supply gets replenished. At the end of lactation, when we stop lactating, when we stop nursing, doesn't matter the time, doesn't matter the age of the baby, the breasts go through a process of involution. And it's pretty much a cleaning up the house of all the cells that were once making milk, and then it returns to a pre-pregnancy state. So it's pretty amazing that a gland can work and can totally stop working, and we still are walk walking around, and we're still going by our days. So we were pretty fascinated by this, and this is exactly what we studied. The reason that we are fascinated by that is that each one of those developmental stages are controlled by genes, by your DNA. And in the way that my lab studies is how DNA structure changes in response to pregnancy development. It's a big word, we call it epigenetic regulation, but it, at the end of the day, pretty much means that what makes genes turn on? Let's say when you're nursing, what are the genes that are turned on to make milk? And what genes turn down? For example, at the end of nursing, when we stop nursing, what makes cells stop making milk and then return to the pre-pregnancy state? And the dynamics of this on and on, we believe that have um, a lot to do with not only how breasts develop through pregnancy, but how breasts then develop through cancer. And understanding that from a normal developmental perspective, it may also yield answers that could also treat or prevent breast cancer. The reason that we become interested in this on and on, this epigenetic change, is because after reading many scientific publications and blogs from moms, we start understanding that it was actually a fact that nursing is more efficient with the second pregnancy, with the second child. And a lot of those blogs, 
were suggesting that it's just because a mom knows better what is doing the second pregnancy, which I totally disagree. I mean, I had a two years old and a premature baby at home, and I had to nurse and make sure that the two years old would not jump out of the table you know, and break his head. There's nothing easy about that. But what we start asking them is, what if in the second pregnancy, breast cells just know what to do better? They learn from the first pregnancy, they know what to do better in the second pregnancy, thus you have an increased milk supply. And that's exactly what the kind of experiments that we did. We, you, we use mice to demonstrate that effect. And what I'm showing here is it's just a different way that we can look at breast tissue. And those protuberances at the end of those large uh, lines, those are ductal structures. That means that the, cell, the, the breast is developing. And what we saw when we put a mouse through a second pregnancy, there's many more of those flower-like structures than you have in mice that are experiencing the first pregnancy, suggesting that the cells are expanding faster and they're responding better to, to pregnancy hormones. They also make milk much sooner than uh, the tissue that it was exposed for the first pregnancy. And again, we have, look at the genes that are on and off, the genes that have difference in their uh, um, DNA structure. And we actually have figured out that there is a memory. There are genes that never get turned that off at the end of the first pregnancy. And because they are kind of on when the, first pregnancy, the second pregnancy comes in, the cells are just working better. Their milk machines are just, you know, working better. What does that have to do with uh, cancer? So pregnancy, by default, is a risk cancer. It is a, is a risk factor for breast cancer. And I will be covering up today two ways in which pregnancy can alter the risk of breast cancer. Women that are pregnant after the age of 25 years old, the uh, green line, immediately after birth, they experience a five-year increase on their predisposition to develop breast cancer. And this is just because breast tissue just expands during pregnancy and they don't return to their pre-pregnancy stage much quicker. Now, if pregnancy happens after the age of 30, here, another chat box to get checked again, um, the five years immediately risk, uh, in increased risk to develop breast cancer never goes down. And that's why then women that have late pregnancies later in their life at an increased risk to develop breast cancer throughout their lifetime. But what we are really interested to understand it's how women that are pregnant early in their age, early, early in their life, 20, 21 years old, um, and how they never have, or they have very little immediately increase to breast cancer risk after delivering a baby. But then the blue line and the red line show that throughout their life, their risk of developing breast cancer really reduces. It's very substantial. It reduces 40%. It covers all subtypes of breast cancer, including those that, um, uh, that arise from women that are BRCA1 mutation carriers. So suggesting, yes? So this is another, this is another complex, uh, uh, complex point of what the studies that are done because we rely on medical records and depending on how the doctors keep their annotation, you know, you know that the woman nurse or we don't know. We don't have nursing information that it makes it clear that nursing is neat. But women are ma making milk even when they are pregnant. And we believe that it has something to do with the milk that are doing pregnancy, but we do not know if it has nursing really associated with that. Nonetheless, nursing is awesome. So I would say nurse. Doesn't hurt. Um, and, okay. and we are really, it's just so hot. Um, what we're really interested to know is why is that women that are pregnant early in their age experience this reduced risk to develop breast cancer? Because we have no very, we don't have many um, preventive strategies to do so that women can prevent themselves to develop breast cancer. 10% of women that will develop breast cancer, they carry on mutations. 90% of women have no genetic known genetic predisposition to breast cancer. So we, we, we are in the dark. 
right? One in eight women in the U.S. will develop breast cancer, and that means that not only themselves will be affected, but um, family members and friends will also be affected by disease. So it, 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 it's, it's a problem. And given that we don't have you know, um, established preventive strategies to prevent breast cancer, other than exercise, drink with moderation, eat healthy. Now we wanted to bring something else more to the table. And in my lab, we go back and forth with two different kinds of analysis. We use mouse models to do the mechanistic part of the analysis, to really ask what kind of DNA conformations those cells are acquiring after pregnancy. What kind of change do not occur when we prevent mice from developing tumors? and what changes do occur, and can we reverse them? And we are very excited that lately we start using with bre human breast tissue. And we are using a strategy that call organoids. And that is an ability that one has to fragment tissue, put it to grow in a three-dimensional matrix, and mimic the develop that the tissue would have in vivo. So we team up with Northwell Hospital, and we have so far collected a series of, uh, of specimens from women that are going for cosmetic surgery, plastic surgery, and they donate their breasts for research, and now we can use, we know when they were pregnant in their life, they were okay in telling us, and now we can understand, translate what we learned from the mouse model into the human model. Uh, we are very excited because we can make human breast tissue organoids believe that they are pregnant. So we can grow those organoids in a dish with a mix of hormones that are only present when a woman is pregnant. And we can follow at day zero, those organoids are very round, so, and there's like about, about 100 cells for each one of those organoids. But when we start growing them with those hormones, they start morphing, they start changing the morphology, they become more three-dimensional, they become as if they are extending arms, so that's what we call branching. And we believe that, that, is, that, that with this kind of strategy, we now can understand not normal development, pregnancy-induced development, normal tissue, but we can then understand the change the pregnancy hormones bring into the DNA structure of human tissue and how can those be understood for prevention of cancer. We can also look at different proteins, different factors in our breast, we're losing this strategy. And what I'm showing here in those different colors are different proteins. But what I showed to you is I would like you to focus on the green stain, um, slide because that is showing proteins that are expressed in the milk. So we are making human breast organoids to make milk in the dish, which is pretty exciting. Uh, what about from the mouse front? What we have been found? So we develop a mouse model in which we can put mouse through pregnancy and then understand the risk of them to develop breast cancer or memory gland cancer. And we found that when mice were never pregnant, they developed uh, early malignant lesions that resemble malignant lesions that humans have, and it would be classified as invasive carcinoma. The cells are trying to escape the breast tissue. When we look at the tissue from mice that have been pregnant before, there is no much abnormality to the tissue, suggesting that whatever pregnancy left to those cells is preventing their ability to turn into cancer. Uh, we have been looking at the DNA, we have been looking at the products of the DNA, and we made a, a pretty awesome observation that just from looking at the structure of the DNA and the product DNA, it gave us a hint that maybe breast cells are speaking to the immune system differently because of pregnancy. It's as if preg first pregnancy is an immunization process, they are recruiting all kinds of immune cells to the breast, and because those immune cells are there, there is like a safe escape mechanism that are preventing the cells from growing out of control and turning to cancer. This is how we look at immune cells in the breast. So we call this strategy flow cytometry. And what I'm showing here is just a cell marker one and a cell marker two, and the combination of those markers define different populations of cells. It's as if when you go to your doctor and your doctor asks you to do a blood count, you know, you go, it's going to give you a number for your red blood cells, it's going to give you a, a number for your white blood cells. So this is pretty much what this kind of assay does. And what we, just, we found out with this um, analysis, and we are still pursuing right now, is that every time that we have a healthy mouse that does not develop cancer, we have those cells here in the tissue. Every time that we have a healthy mouse 
that develops cancer, those tissues are gone, which is that left upper panel. But every time that independent of the pregnancy, mice got sick, they developed some sort of inflammation, those cells are not there, and then the tissue will have cancer. So it says, you know, pregnancy changed to DNA, it's alternating and it's changing the communication of the immune system, and that is important to block the cells from going to cancer. Um, I would be very selfish to say that this was done just because I did, because it's not. I need to acknowledge a lot of people. I have uh, those beautiful people that are here to my, my lab members. Um, I'm so lucky to have them there. Some of them are here. So if you don't want to ask me questions, go ask them questions. They, they do the experiments as well. Put you on the fire right now. Um, we have an assortment of advisors, including breast cancer advocates. I'm so happy, Joanne, that you could make. Thank you so much. And we also have to acknowledge uh, the funding agencies they have been um, giving us money. This is a question that people are trying to address for many, many years, but it's risky. And because people believe that we were in the right path, and I'm not, sure, I'm not telling you that we are done, but at least we are now on a path that we believe that we can immunize uh, a mouse at least to prevent breast cancer. And I also wanted to thank uh, my home crew. <laughs> That's right. Um, they're all sick at home, <laughs> uh, which is sad. Um, but the reason that I wanted to mention that is also to say that, you know, being a mother, a woman in science, sometimes you have to do your work even though you wanted to stay home and cuddle with the people that you love are sick. But I'm very, very lucky to have people that understand and they may be watching me. Yeah. Uh, uh, Thank you so much for listening, and I will try my best to answer any questions if there are any questions. All right. uh, I'm going to run around with the microphone and start trying to ask questions. Here we go. We already got one. Hi. Hi. I have a cousin whose mother died from breast cancer, and so she had the gene, and not only did that happen, but she had her children later in life. Mm -hmm. She had breast cancer mm -hmm. at the same age as her mom. Mm -hmm. She had a lumpectomy, uh, chemo, radiation, normal routine, five years of tamoxifen, and last year, 16 years later, okay. it's back. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. But she was drinking. <laughs> No, because they say alcohol has a, plays a role. So everything has a role when you do it extreme, right? Even exercise. I don't, I didn't say that. Everybody should exercise. Um, <laughs> alcohol consumption, smoking, drugs, that debilitates your immune system, right? Now, if you're on the edge of anything, breast cancer, um, inflammation of your, 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 your spleen, that, that is the tipping, you know, the tipping point that it, it drives you down. Um, breast cancer is a little bit more complicated, and this is why we believe that prevention should be studied, because it's very heterogeneous. So we have many types of breast cancer cells without inside of a cancer. And we try our best to identify uh, treatments that will target them all but sometimes the treatment doesn't target them all. So let's say then in a treatment, you know, killed 99% of your cells. There's just one, and it's just waiting. That's all it takes. It's just waiting for, you know, aging. Aging is known to suppress your immune system. A little bit, too much of alcohol is known to suppress the immune system. Those cells are just waiting for them to take over again. We call that dormancy. So the cells, they, drop, they, they sleep, and then all of a sudden they, are, they wake up. There's a lot of research being put into dormancy because actually breast cancer kills men because of metastasis, because of disease relapse. When disease comes back, it's harder to treat from the first, than you did for the first time. It's more invasive, it's more aggressive, and just wants to take it over. 
right? So this is why we believe that study prevention is as important as studying new therapeutic targets to target business. I'm sorry to hear about this. So you're saying it comes back with more, more, uh, you know, more. Often comes back because you select it. So let's say that, that the first drug, and I'm not saying that it should not, that it should refuse treatment for the first time. I'm not an oncologist. You know, I'm a, I'm a PhD, so whatever doctor that is. Not a real doctor. Um, but it happens. It, it doesn't happen all the time. You know, I have, I have an aunt that she's breast cancer free for 30 years. And I've, knock on wood, but I've also seen people that relapse. I was at the National Breast Cancer Coalition with Joanne this year. And you hear those women's stories, like, you know, that they were 30 years without cancer and then come back. So we, we can't predict. This is why we under, believe that understand the DNA, when maybe we can come up with prediction factors much better that it can, do, you know, better predict your predisposition. Thank you. You're okay. Uh, I haven't figured out how to word this question. Mm -hmm. um, being that getting pregnant younger mm -hmm. doesn't always work out for people. They just right. It's not the easiest thing to do. Right. It's not like going to the doctor. Right. It's, it's a very, it's a it's lifelong an, commitment. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I would never. Might, <laughs> right. So my. Not into, you know, young women in the audience. Right. There's not a talk. <laughs> so then we can, you know, get so pregnant at your age. <laughs> so here's my question. Being that you have figured out why these early pregnancies, um, lead to a decreased risk mm -hmm. for getting breast cancer. Mm -hmm. Might future research find a way to mimic yes. what happens to the cells in the breast yes. without having to be? Yes, this is what we're doing, right? We think that this changing some DNA in the immune cells, I can talk louder than that. Don't test me. <laughs> Had no idea. Um, if we we believe that we can't, we have ways to bring some of chains to breast cells, and at the same time immunize your body to bring in those immune cells that I was just telling you, and that would decrease the risk. Again, we can never guarantee that is a hundred percent decrease, right? We we wanted to think so. You know, and we mirror what we do um, with human papillomavirus virus vaccine for cervical cancer. It has had a substantial decrease in amount of women, you know, with um, or young women with cervical cancer. So this is how we see how it goes from an experiment perspective and basic science. That and this is why it's important to come to events like that, so then we can show to you that we basic scientists. We do stuff that is important for health too, and you know we should be getting funding for it. Uh, but yes, there is a path. We are not close to the end of the path, but we are walking the path. So have you ever evaluated the, the time that you need to be pregnant? Do you need to have a term pregnancy to have these positive, I mean, preventive effects? What happens if you have? Or Great question. So the question was, how long does a woman has to be pregnant for to get the protective effects? Uh, the, there, are, there was research that was recently published. 32 weeks is the magic number. It's almost term. I miss both times. <laughs> so as those that we have when um, we're from women, yes, not mice. Non mice. Those are human. Yeah. So it has to be close to term. And one of the uh, hypotheses, the speculations, it has to do with menstrual cycle. So women throughout their menstrual cycle, they have, they experience a mild expansion of their breast tissue. And when we get our period, our breast tissue regresses, but it's very minimal. Scientists believe that being exposed to those effects for a very long time, meaning not having babies until 30, um, you increase the ability of your cells to acquire mutations. And then during pregnancy, those mutations, those mutated cells can take off as cancers. Pregnancy then does not allow you for this, you know, same, like 
you know, accordion kind of effect. You know, it just it's just always there. So it, it's and because there's a rapid turnover of cells, cells that are make and cells that are dying. It, it's be, it believed that it would decrease the ability to DNA mutation to be established and expand the cells and enter into cancer. So 32 weeks for women is the correct number. We cannot mimic that in mice because um, um, we, if you know, in the way that their anatomy is made, we cannot deliver their pups before time without killing the mom. And um, what about the starting of your menstrual cycle? So for, for how many years before right. getting pregnant? Because you may have your first menstrual cycle at 10 years old. In fact, now it's very common. Yes. No? The, the age. Yes younger and younger, mm -hmm. so. Absolutely, well, menarche is a risk factor for breast cancer in the same way that menopause, right? Age, the, the earlier you get your period and the later that you stop getting your period, they're also known to modulate the, the risk of cancer. In the way that women that have their period later in their life are uh, at decreased risk, and women that are uh, get their period er uh, earlier in their life at increased risk. So all this all play tape. This is why, it's in, um, it's difficult to decide that I'm just gonna do a human genomic analysis. I don't know where I'm gonna look in the DNA. I'm just gonna look throughout the DNA. This is why it's hard to do in humans because there's so many moving parts from the puzzle. And this is why we choose to do it in mice because in mice, we know that they start, they become fertile, which is the equivalent for us at four weeks. We breed them at this age, and this is how long they live. So it's a little bit more control. And now the point, because we know what has changed, you know, now we can go back and then look at human tissue. We have a question in the back. Oh, here, here first. With the chart that you had up about when people, when women got pregnant and not, I was, I saw there's a peak. Is that more chance of having yes. getting pregnant? Is there an age range? So it depends on the age of pregnancy. Like yes. later. Yes. The, the if, light blue one. Yes. So if you look at the green, 25 to 30, it's a five years risk immediately after the first baby. If you look at the purple that's after 30, it's about seven to 10. If you go to the 35, it can be 12 and it can never go down. But again, the reason that we study that is that not only women are getting, you know, they are having their babies later in their life, but we are forgetting to talk about male breast cancer, right? Which tends to be even more aggressive than female breast cancer because we are aware of an anatomy, right? It's there. We are touching it up once a month, I hope so. You know, we are very aware. And men are not aware of their glands because they do not have it throughout their life. And usually when men discover that they have breast cancer, it's very aggressive is usually invasive and it's harder to treat. So something that does not depend on pregnancy hormones is beneficial for male breast cancer as well. All right, we'll get the question back here. Um, I've heard a lot of controversy regarding the birth control pill mm -hmm. and in relation to estrogen positive breast cancer. Looking at this, especially with the age, do you feel there's a correlation as to how long the woman was on the birth control pill, the age she was taking right. birth control related to right. the chart that you're looking at here? Yeah, yeah. For the data here that I'm presenting, we had no annotation for if women were or not on birth control, right? Um, there, are many way, there are many reasons for why women take birth control, right? You can have uh, ovarian cysts, and then you start on birth control when you're like 12 because you're just preventing, you know, blood loss. So uh, in that case, it, you're not delaying pregnancy because you want. You're, del you, you, you're taking the, con the, the birth control to prevent pain. But the majority of us, we take birth control to delay pregnancy. Okay? So it, it's, it's, it's a hard thing to uncouple, and I don't think that it has been uh, clearly described. Although uh, birth control decreased the risk of uh, um, ovarian cancer, right? So it's, it's all juggling. Yeah. Come on right here. <laughs> oh, Aliyah, he threw you on the fire. <laughs> okay. Next. Another victim. Come on.
Right, right. So when I first came to the U.S., I was studying blood development, and I've always been interested in understanding genes that are on and genes that are off, epigenetics, because I was studying blood development. Um, so then when I moved to Cold Spring Harbor, I was made the offer to continue to work on that, and it was actually, that's why I was hired, because I was bringing an expertise to the lab that the lab did not have, which was hematopoiesis, how blood, develop, how blood stem cells develop. I was at that point really looking for to shift my career focus and start thinking what I wanted to do down the road, right? And it just, it was just appalling to me that we know so much about breast cancer and we knew so little about normal breast. I mean, we all have it, right? <laughs> uh, so that's what got me to understand normal breast biology. And as I developed in my studies and start understanding ways that we can isolate those cells and ask what genes are on and genes are off in different cells of the breast, then came in the idea that maybe understanding normal development, it would yield answers that it could you know, address why breast cancer developed to begin with in the absence of a no mutation. And this is how I got into pregnancy in um, cancer. Yeah, when I, uh, about 40 years ago, I was able to uh, take over a clinic in a um, convent on Long Island. And these women were all in their 80s, and um, a very high percentage of them had breast cancer. Mm -hmm. Of course, they were never pregnant. Right. Interestingly, the breast cancer that they had was never aggressive. Mm. Uh, it wasn't an invasive kind of breast cancer. In fact, a lot of them chose not to treat it. Oh. And they lived with breast cancer for a very long time. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, you know, have you ever heard of uh, a study about that? Mm -hmm. Is it because of the lack of hormone, uh, uh, you know, accentuation of the, of the cancer? Or? Right. So um, this is why actually people became interested in the effect of pregnancy and breast cancer because exactly from studies like that, that women that have never had kids before, they start developing breast cancer. They are more at risk to develop breast cancer. Um, there is a, a breast cancer disease subtype, which is called DCIS, which stands for ductal in carcinoma, which means that it's a small lesion, it's very indolent, don't grow, doesn't grow very fast. And it has now been, you know, a lot of women are coming up with disease like that, and the medical community are asking the same question. Should we treat something that is not growing? So, um, you know, and it comes back with this over-treatment uh, of women. I can't speak, you know, at a, in a post-menopausal age is at the age that all women are, are at risk to develop breast cancer. I can't really speak to the fact that uh, at their stage in their lives, their cancers were a little or less aggressive than um, than, than younger women. I, I can't. I, I would not have uh, a, a scientifically based um, answer to that. But but women women with those kind of indolent breast cancers are across ages, and there's really being a discussion about do we need to treat those women or should we, you know, should we just watch it closely? Right. Nowadays, women at 40, it it, it's much more common to be to see women at 40 develop cancer, and usually those cancers are more aggressive as well. There is a lot of research environmental cues. You know, what is the environment around us um, have to do with that? There's a lot of studies, you know, around ethnicity. Uh, 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 Jewish descendants, they are in a predisposition to develop certain types of breast cancer, and it's very aggressive, and the other population is not. So we still don't understand what are those, the markers that define ethnicity-specific breast cancer, to the same point that we do not know what women that do not carry no mutations, why would they develop breast cancer then? So Camilla, very interesting talk. I'm just, you know, we inherit stuff from our mom and dad, mm -hmm. and then 
you know, we get what we get. It's the law, it's the cards. Right. And then how much do you think is above and beyond what we get? So, are you asking about prevention? Or are you asking about predisposition? Are you asking about pregnancy prevention? If our moms got, get a, had us at an early age, do we get something from them as a benefit? Or are you asking about mutations that increase predisposition overall? Well, I, uh, the first general question is predisposition. Yes, so there are familial cases. There, is, there, is, there are familial cases that are still unknown what kind of mutations they have that drive breast cancer. There are. And all, we, all those families know is that they are at a risk, right? So then all we have to do for those families right now, all those women have to do is to have mammograms more often. It's really exercise. Exercise really decreases the risk of breast cancer. I'm not, I'm not joking. It really does. Um, and, 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 and a surveillance. For those, for those that lack mutations, I mean, I can go on on epigenetics because I think that there is a way that, you know, gene, the, the, the structure of DNA is not totally on and off that could have a deal with that. Um, there are diseases that impair your immune system surveillance to disease. It could have had a play a role in that too. So the list just keeps on going. Yeah. All right. I think we're gonna wrap things up now, everybody. If you have any more burning questions for Camilla, She'll be here, maybe? Yeah, he has oh, one more question. We got one more burning question. <laughs> this always bothers me. I know you're doing great research. The laboratory does great research. Mm -hmm. How do you share research with other laboratories across the United States besides just reading journals? Mm -hmm. Because we've been working on cancer mm -hmm. since I can remember in high school mm -hmm. and I'm 80. Mm -hmm. And they're making some progress, but what bothers me is you get a grant and you do research and you might have 11 patients or 20 you're studying. What about hundreds of thousands of other people who all the other scientists are doing research on? How do you share that? Right. So it's part of our job, scientific communication, not only for what we publish and we discover, but you know, we know now more than we did 10 years before that we have to have collaborative efforts, right? We at Cold Spring Harbor, we acknowledge that and that's why we have Team Upper Northwell. So now I have the opportunity to work with breast oncologists, to work with gynecologists that would perhaps bring in to my research that is basically mo in models something that happens in humans. Uh, there are meetings that they, we call those think tank. You know, it's a bunch of people on a tank, inside of a tank, thinking about a problem. We have a lot of those at the lab, and the, the goal for those meetings is to bring in unpublished data, data that is not available at journals, that can highly motivate clinical trials, clinical trials or collaboration between different centers to really merge interests together. Three years ago, there was one of the lab that was sponsored by the Basser Foundation um, that pretty much uh, takes care of BRCA patients. So there are meetings that we scientists and oncologists, we go to to discuss data that hasn't been published, data that has the potential of doing something. We don't know, right? But really to open up the discussion for the benefit of the patients. Uh, last year, uh, two years ago, I organized at the lab a meeting with oncologists um, and surgeons from Northwell presenting scientific data to doctors that deal with those patients. And they are now asking us in the same way that Breast Advocates tells us, what should we be doing, right? I can go on and on about how cool the science that we do, that we do is because it is cool. Um, but we do look for advice to make it um, relevant to patients' life. One thing more. Uh -huh. Electronic health records. Nobody wants it released, but you could take the name off the insurance company. A lot of hospitals don't want to share their records. A lot of times you go to a hospital and you had a test. Oh, no, we got to redo the test because we don't trust the other one. But if we had that availability with computers on big data, get a lot of info. Yes, and you know, it's, it's so hard to work with uh, 
human tissue, you know. It's a train, so we have to train the oncologist, so then the oncologist is able to speak to the patient about the research. And then the nurse and the whole surgical team have to be aware that that specimen has to be process, processed in this way so that when we get to the lab, it's, it's viable and we can use. It's, it's a whole training system. It's not only about the electronic records. It's training the medical community to, 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 so then we work together. And we here to them to, to work together. Great, thank you Camilla. Thank you.